Uh, my name is Mike Kopsik, um, and welcome to our presentation today on obtaining understanding, admitting business documents, and civil papers. I'm here today with uh, my friend Steve Pedno of Forensic Accounting Services. I'm my friend Tom Repton, her advocate partner in English, and I'll be telling you more about both of what this channel is when we get to their portion of the presentation today. Uh, before we begin, I well, thank you. I want to extend thanks to Jeanette and Jan for their uh, able service and assisting uh, us in putting this presentation together today. I'd also like to thank the Bar Association's litigation section, of which I'm, I'm a member, um, litigation committee, um, for, for helping and encourage this seminar. And um, I'd also like to thank Tom's staff for helping with the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the structure of the presentation today is, is basically in three segments. I'm going to be giving an introduction and an overview on the cases where the business record is dispute. Steve is going to do a deeper dive on these documents uh, and expand your understanding of what to do once you advance on, on, on this information, as well as discussing the reliability of the information that you obtain. Uh, and, and trying to reconcile that information with your theory of the case, be it a defense or, or an affirmative claim. Tom has explained you know, how do we get these documents into evidence in support of claims and defenses. Now, as you probably saw from the material we've got Tom to cover here, and I'm going to try to move through this very quickly. Um, we're going to save time at the end for question and answer rather than try to interrupt the flow it might be a little difficult to do so given that some of the time we're remote and some are here in person. So if I can ask you to try to um, uh, chat down your questions and save them to the end. And I believe all three panelists had planned on um, sticking around for a little while after that uh, to continue some more discussion and get back with you. So let me begin by giving you a little bit of my own background. I'm the managing partner at Conference to the Capsella, and I've been uh, practicing in the area of commercial litigation for, for 34 years. And uh, my alternate title for this presentation today was going to be How did an English major end up uh, examining financial records and cross examining accountants? Um, frankly, I learned the hard way. There was a lot of on-the-job training, some of which were provided by many of you um, with whom I've had cases and acted, um, where we learned um, from opposing counsel um, their interpretation and application of the law, uh, as well as from some patient judges. And I benefited greatly from experience with a number of expert witnesses, including um, Steve Pedner. Um, so one of the things that I learned in that 34 years is to figure out quickly what you don't know and learn how you're going to get that information. And that's often where reliance on expert witnesses uh, comes into play. So with that little bit of background, we're going to talk briefly about the types of cases where these issues most typically arise. Uh, beginning first with the breach of fiduciary duty claims. Um, obviously, that's the most common uh, types of cases where uh, you're doing a, a, a deeper dive into financial records. Often, these cases are, are grounded in a relationship between parties, one uh, that is often very personal in nature, uh, be it partners, uh, members of an LLC, a trustee and a beneficiary, um, or, or occasionally a trusted financial advisor. Fraud, embezzlement, and then civil theft cases uh, often cry out for uh, information regarding uh, financial behaviors and, and documentation. Many of these instances involve um, employer-employee relationships um, where there is uh, an, an issue or concern about um, misuse of funds. A third category, business dissolutions, both under our C Corp statute 33 898 and the revised LLC statute 34267. In the course of dissolving businesses, there is still a fiduciary obligation um, between uh, owners and members. 
and there are particular rights under both statutes where um, a petitioning um, plaintiff in a corporate dissolution case is essentially putting their shares on the auction block for a period of time and issues regarding valuation and the timing of when claims or financial adjustments that may arise out of breach of fiduciary duty claims become quite germane. Another category of cases um, that many of you probably have experienced uh, are, are partitions. Uh, partitions of real estate are also statutory in, in nature, um, particularly Connecticut General Statutes 52-495 and a relatively new statute called the Heirs Partition Statute 52-503F. Um, while these proceedings are grounded in the party's title rights, the financial history of the relationship is often outcome determinative in a hearing ultimately to determine vision of the property or uh, public auction sale proceeds. Um, and obviously, uh, um, in partition cases, the, the, the contents of the appraisal are also meaningful and result. And, and, and lots of time being spent in understanding how the property was valued and whether it was correctly valued in the first place. Um, claims for accounting under the statute 52 401, uh, obviously that speaks for themselves. Somebody is in a fiduciary relationship and feels as though that that relationship may have been abused. And over um, many matters, I have learned to uh, occasionally utilize uh, this section of the practice book, um, which is one of our slides. And, and, and it specifically states that the court or any judge thereof may refer any pending matter to an accountant of the books or accounts. And it goes on to say how the accountant goes about making such an examination and what they do with that and the, the cost sharing obligations. And although it's in the section of the practice book uh, under the general heading of references, I, I've seen this uh, practice book section triggered by the party's motions to request for it intervene, as well as the court do so on a pseudo sponte basis in a matter that um, may just be spiraling out of control and the parties have warning contentions as to the veracity of certain financial information and the court feels that its analysis would benefit from an independent uh, accounting investigation. Um, certainly derivative actions, um, where there's a claim by a shareholder or under the new revised LLC statute, uh, a claim by a member um, regarding um, corporate misconduct or questioning corporate authority. Probate matters uh, are, are ripe for investigative opportunities with regard to uh, such things as power of attorney accountings, the trust accountings. There is a, a growing number of cases in the court system today and a growing body of Connecticut law uh, over how and when uh, an agent exceeds their authority under the power of attorney and who, when, and where those things um, can be mitigated. Um, by, by those affected by the believers. And last but not least, um, certainly divorce lawyers need to have a solid working understanding as to how to obtain documents germane to the operation of one of the parties' businesses and business-related income and, and making a determination of, of, of how to dissolve the marriage and do so in, in a fair fashion. Um, we thought it would be helpful today to uh, use a hypothetical. Um, I'm not going to read you guys the hypothetical. Um, I know the case quite well since it was one that Steve and I worked on, on, on together. Um, it has sort of all of the hallmarks of, of, of the type of case where lawyers' tasks are focused on and analyzing financial documents and business records. Uh, it involved uh, several healthcare providers that formed an LLC. Uh, to provide non-medical community-based services to people who had suffered from traumatic brain injuries. And um, it, it, because of the nature of the work, the Department of Social Services was heavily involved in uh, imposing credentialing requirements and all of the scheduling and time and billing 
was managed through a sophisticated Medicaid verification system so that they could authenticate that the work that was performed uh, was actually performed and it was appropriately billed um, by those who were appropriately credentialed to do so. So the parties come together with the best of intentions and it, it has sort of the classic uh, setup in that one member was the rainmaker, one member was more I guess touchy feely when it came to client interaction it was very well liked and very well regarded in the industry. And the third member was sort of a final overseer who claimed to have a background uh, in, in accounting, although as time wore on, it became relatively apparent that that was a, a bit embellished. So in the operating agreement, they're all designated as co-managers, but certainly the member with the financial experience from the very onset, really wrested control of all of the important information, um, the, the, the bank account information, the tax returns, the vendor billing, uh, the collection side of the equation. Uh, and the other two were sort of widely disinterested uh, and, and pretty unsophisticated. So as revenues grew, um, the parties engaged in certain behaviors that started to tweak the other members and, and call into question um, the fairness of the relationship. The member in financial control um, started to compensate herself in a way that seemed questionable. The two out in the field were running some personal expenses through the company's accounts. And ultimately, it just blew up mm -hmm. um, in a meeting that um, I happened to be present at, where there were lots and lots of accusations and we thought we might, might be able to cobble the pieces back together. When lo and behold, the member who controlled the financial side of the equation, um, in, in a matter of 24 hours, we, we finished, um, brings a lawsuit and essentially locks down the financial information. When I say locks down, I mean physically locks it down to prevent complete access. So with that as some context, our, our presentation and discussion today, um, you can see where that case ultimately leads. So the first order of business was, was to determine, you know, what, what documents we were going to seek out in all of this. Um, and, and, and certainly that included obtaining the financial statements. Um, Steve's gonna explain in some greater detail the content of the financial statement really means um, but I think there are plenty of lawyers out there that don't understand when a request is made for a financial statement, what ultimately is supposed to be produced. Um, there, are, there were also needs in this instance to, to consider uh, some valuation information to obtain tax returns. Um, I'm just gonna skip ahead to a form that we utilized in this case because there was house of on behalf of one of the members to provide access to tax returns that were now all of a sudden under lock and key. We were able to utilize the transcript request form, um, which is an IRS form that can be signed by, by any owner. It's not necessarily the sole owner in charge of uh, the company's finances. Um, getting the vendor contracts and invoices then allowed us to develop an understanding of the expense side of the ledger. But one of the key difficulties in the case was getting access to the quick book records, as well as any other accounting software records that included calendar, appointment, and scheduling information. Certainly, this case and many others required the production of documents that were stored electronically, like emails, texts, and phone records. Now, this is certainly not an exhaustive list of what council is seeking in every one of these cases um, where there's ongoing dispute, but it's certainly an instructive list of the types of things that most of us are, are, are in need of obtaining and ultimately understanding. So how do you go about obtaining these in, in most instances? Well, typically there is uh, some contractual rights for the parties to attempt to enforce. And here in our hypothetical, there, there was an operating agreement. And I've taken 
some liberties uh, and piece together a slide that shows the types of typical operating agreement provisions that govern a member's right to information. Um, and I would describe these as, as, as having sort of three basic categories. There's a disclosure obligation, um, there is a maintenance obligation, and there are, are access and inspection rights. So the manager has an obligation under you know, this particular operating agreement to provide information to the members on a regular basis. The managers also had an obligation to maintain certain records in a way that they were accessible to those who had an ownership interest in the business who, who would have occasionally have need for them. And lastly, there was a clear and fine right uh, for the members to access this information uh, upon reasonable notice and request. Unfortunately, in this case, uh, simply asserting these rights under the operating agreement didn't really get us in. So now the lawyers come in and go to the next slide, which was really asserting their rights under the statute. And in this particular instance, given that it was an LLC, the member's right to information um, was pretty well defined um, in Connecticut General Statutes 34.255i, um, as well as in a C corporation, there are shareholder inspection rights uh, that provide essentially similar mechanisms to trigger how one gets these documents. It, it is not um, without its limits, because if you're going to enforce these rules, you're going to have to play by them. And what I mean by that is that when a demand was made for inspection of information, um, that required adherence to the rules and that the demand had to be reasonable. The demand itself had to be reasonably precise and particular. And there had to be some legitimacy in its purpose, all of which uh, will know are requirements under these statutes um, that it can't be a, a blunderbuss approach to try to maintain or obtain everything under the sun uh, for no apparent reason. And the statute contemplates that in certain instances, a member may only walk in requesting information and can impose reasonable restrictions on access to that information. So unfortunately with this case, um, as I mentioned, uh, it didn't resolve itself through an exchange of lawyer's letter, nor, nor did the right to information become any easier um, through the lawyer's initial involvement. So the parties, uh, once the suit began, exercised their discovery rights. Now, our practice book rules on discovery are well known, but within practice book section 13-9, in addition to the garden variety requests for production and interrogatories that get generated in this case, it's often helpful to remember that there is an inspection right embedded in 13-9 that allows one the opportunity to inspect, copy, photograph, and reproduce designated documents. Um, obviously, the university cases are uh, the university of documents to obtain were not just limited to those in the possession of parties. Um, there was a need to issue some third party subpoenas. Um, and many of those were issued to um, folks via it was typically referred to as a keeper of the records deposition notice with a subpoena due to state and attached. I will remind all of you that when you do so, uh, it is important to remember the discovery time rules, both in terms of using uh, the practice book section uh, provisions on, on disclosure and production. Um, that it can't be an 11 hour request to a party without the party having the right to assert uh, an, an objection to that. Um, as, as if it's utilized to circumvent the, the ordinary rules of how much time one has to uh, uh, produce the documents and or object to them, uh, that's often um, raised by the, the receiving party. One of the other conundrums in this case and, and in most others uh, had to do with electronically stored information. Um, you'll see here from our practice book, we have a pretty 
broad definition of what constitutes ESI and means any information stored in an electronic medium that is retrievable in perceivable form. I'm not quite sure I know what that means, um, but but certainly electronically stored information um, is part of our world today and, and a necessary um, activity for, for lawyers in terms of seeking this information uh, and often a an opportunity for uh, motion practice when one side claims that the information should not be accessed or is particularly burdensome or expensive to produce. There are rights to seek protective orders in those circumstances. There are also ramifications to failing to provide the information that is stored electronically when it should be produced. I would encourage you when you are on the receiving end of either a litigation hold letter or a request for electronically stored information to vet those in your client's universe that are most knowledgeable with how this information is actually stored instead of relying on what might be your primary client contact. Um, the person you're dealing with might not have any idea of the IT side of the business, and you may be asking for some serious trouble if you rely on that person's re representation, that certain activities regarding um, the deletion of electronically stored information or the, um, the periodic deletion of electronically stored uh, information um, is being followed. Um, so I would encourage you to drill down whenever possible to uh, talk with the person most knowledgeable within the organization about how electronically stored information is maintained. There are also other limits that uh, apply and when one is seeking information uh, of a financial nature. I'm just gonna skip ahead to a couple of slides. Um, disclosure of financial information uh, is prohibited under Connecticut uh, General Statutes 36A-42 by financial institutions unless they are subject to a lawful subpoena, summons, warrant, or court order. However, due to some recent consolidation and merger activity in the Connecticut banking community and the rise of many regional and national banks in our market, oftentimes the challenges presented are more practical. Trying to find the location with which to serve the subpoena, trying to interface with a whole legion of, of bank employees who are not often particularly cooperative, in terms of providing this information on a timely basis can become the bane of the lawyer's uh, existence trying to obtain third-party records through a subpoena served on a financial institution. And last but not least, um, the limitation on obtaining tax returns is what is considered by Connecticut courts to really be sort of a quasi-privilege. Um, there is no real defining Connecticut appellate authority that provides sort of a blanket evidentiary rule as to when a tax return can be obtained in discovery or, or when it is admissible. Um, and these citations, uh, including um, the Gantano versus Price Waterhouse Cooper case, indicate that courts apply a balancing test um, to determine whether or not the material sought is directly relevant. And is there a compelling need shown by the party requesting the return and an inability to obtain it from other sources? So if you think you're just going to get a hold of the tax return and start pawing through it for purposes of questioning someone's veracity or credibility because of how they um, report their income on an income tax return, that, that is often not how the courts view the activity associated with obtaining tax returns and other tax records. Um, we're going to try to keep this moving along, and I am uh, out of my allotted time, and I'm at this point going to turn it over to Steve Pedno. Um, and Steve's going to take control of the uh, slides for us here. Um, and I want to give Steve uh, the benefit of a brief introduction. He is the principal of Forensic Accounting Services 
a local CPA firm, Manchester, that specializes in forensic accounting, fraud investigation, and litigation support matters. Uh, he's worked in public accounting for over 30 years, is a CPA, a certified fraud examiner, and certified in financial forensics. He has authored four books on fraud, The Anatomy of Fraud Investigations, Preventing and Protecting Employee Theft and Embezzlement, and Forensic Accounting and Fraud Investigation for Non-Experts. He has written numerous articles appearing in local and national publications, has spoken um, on a wide variety of subjects, including forensic accounting um, throughout the region as well as the country. And he is also an adjunct professor at the University of Connecticut. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my friend Steve and his uh, very able slide presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all for having us today. Um, I start by saying with this audience, I'm one of those recipients of your cross-examinations and uh, depositions or uh, having sat through many of them, uh, which is all right, it's part of the job. Um, I've actually been a forensic accountant for 30 years and 100% and, uh, of our clients are attorneys. Uh, we, we're structured that way if we get a case um, we're retained by counsel. So I'm very used to working with attorneys. Uh, this sub subject is, uh, is near and dear to me because there's nothing for us to do as forensic accounts until we have records, right? I mean, we probably have a dozen cases right now that we've been retained and we're just waiting. We're, we have nothing to analyze. We have nothing to review. Um, it's not our battle. We don't write subpoenas. We don't issue search warrants. Um, we certainly work as consulting experts regularly to help write those and give the content for what you're looking for. But um, we don't, our data doesn't start until we have something to review or analyze. And um, there's definitely some themes that have been happening, especially in the last, I'll say five to 10 years that I think are important when we talk about business documents and, and whatnot. And, and the theme is always the same. It's, it's accessibility, it's reliability, and it's adequacy. And it doesn't matter, we're in all the different contexts that uh, uh, Mike had mentioned. Uh, most notably these days, we seem to be spending a tremendous amount of time in probate court with uh, fiduciary duty and accountings and either auditing them or helping to put them together and things like that. It's always the same. It's, it's always getting access to the records. What do the records tell us? And, and are they reliable and are they adequate? And there are things that are happening beyond all of our controls just in the world of business these days that are impacting all three of these. And, and so it's changing. Uh, and we'll start with the discussion on accessibility. All right, how do we get access to those records? All right, now in our world, you know, there's there's really only three ways to get records you know, with the party's permission. So sometimes the parties cooperate and, and it works. So let's say in a divorce context, the, the husband may say, listen, I'll write a letter to the bank and I'll instruct them to give access to all of my records, just go get them, you can pay for them. Well, the problem is the banks don't, they don't acknowledge that anymore. They, they don't respond to them. They won't provide them. Uh, it's going to take the party to come into the into the bank and request from themselves, and they'll only give them to the account holder. Now, if you're trying to find that somebody is not showing you everything, deceiving you, trying to hide accounts, doing all the things we're looking for at times, we don't necessarily want the records to go to the account holder. We want them to go directly to some third party so we know we've got all the records and there's no gaps and holes and things. So it's a problem. So that process has changed and we're now having to, you know, have the party go get their own records and then hope that they give them to us and they didn't take any out or they didn't change anything or do anything with them along the way. The second way, of course, is by subpoena or court order. Um, if I'm working, if I'm retained directly by court, for example, in probate court, I may just ask the probate judge to issue us a court order for the records. Uh, it's always interesting when you deliver that to a bank or an institution and they say, well, that's a probate judge. That's not really a judge in Connecticut. And that's really disrespectful, but that's the reality of what we get. And we say, well, that's fine. I will let your honor know that that was your message, that they're not a real judge. And uh, we've had a discussion about whether they should give us the records or not. Um, 
but I don't think from my perspective, I don't think that the institutions and the people who are receiving these subpoenas are taking them as seriously as they did in the past. And they're certainly not complying as quickly or as readily or as completely as they have in the past. Um, and I've just watched this unfold. The third way, which works really well, but is a search warrant. Unfortunately, that involves getting criminal justice involved. Now a whole new dynamic comes into the case. I've done well over 400 embezzlements myself. I mean, it is not uncommon that law enforcement is involved and they can get a search warrant and institutions and things seem to still respond to a search warrant fairly well. The question then is, will the prosecutor allow the records to be shared with the expert who's working with the attorney on the civil aspect or the insurance claim or the other components beyond the crime? So, we're finding more and more that it's getting to be a challenge to get access to the records. And I think in the past, if the records weren't maintained by the person who should have maintained them, because they had a fire, a flood, they moved, whatever it is, the reason that they don't have them anymore, or they simply don't want to make them available, well, you could turn alternative places to get them, but that's shutting off. And so that's part of accessibility is going to the traditional sources it is not reliable anymore. Um, you may get lucky, but more and more, we're not getting the records we want. Mike had mentioned banks. So banks are changing, their systems change, their personnel change, they're acquired, they close. If you take the most recent M&T merger, which I was part of, I was also part of People's United Bank, otherwise known as People's Bank. Otherwise, I had a United Bank. I was part of Farmington Bank. They all became part of People's United Bank over time. If you ask for records for seven years, they may not even have the systems to get you those records because it has changed so many times. And then even if they have the systems, is there someone there who can access it? So more and more, there's delays in getting them. There's gaps. Uh, when this merger occurred, I know because I was an account holder that the statements and transactions came over initially, but the check images up prior to the merger did not. So bank statements are good. They're helpful for someone like me, but all they list is check numbers and amounts. They don't tell me who the checks were paid to. I need the images. So if they don't bring the images over, we're never going to really know, bless you, we're never going to really know who the disbursements were for because we don't have the check -in. So these are some of the challenges that we're facing as the world of banking changes. And some of the banks that are now existing are virtual banks. They're not even bricks and mortar banks. They're virtual banks. They don't have branches. Then we have credit unions. And credit unions are, are a different animal altogether. There are different levels of credit unions. Some are rather sophisticated. Some are rather basic. And some of the systems that they have are, I'll say, antiquated. And it's no bash on credit unions. It's just, it is what it is. They have members, they have member accounts, they have different terminology. And uh, in a recent case, we got, they don't even place decimal places on their statements still. So all the dollar amounts are just, their digits. And you have to figure out at looking at these that you really got to move it over two places that it's not $10,000. It's really, it's, it's $100. They just never change the system with print decimal places. And this all takes time. And they're most likely going to give it to you on paper, which is very time consuming and laborious for us to try to figure out what happened over a five year period on paper statements that don't have decimal places. Um, and that all just complicates this accessibility. Credit cards. Credit cards come up a lot in all of the contexts, right? And the credit card companies also are becoming more and more challenging to get the replacement statements. And they only want to give them to the cardholder. Well, if your embezzler was using their card for business expenses and running it through the business, you want to get their statements, but you can't get their statements because they'll only produce them for the cardholder, who is, by the way, you're the person that you're targeting. So you're running into all these challenges to get the records to put this together that we're not able to do. Um, even if we get the records, it doesn't tell us necessarily what the stuff is for. 
If we don't have the invoices, if we have the, don't have the corresponding documentation, if we don't have the receipts, then we can tell you what transactions occurred on the bank statement, on the credit card statement. There seems to be a lot of activity at Home Depot. Well, what are they buying? I have no idea. I, I can't, I don't know. I might get lucky on the statement and tell you what branch they were at. Home Depot is really good if they can reproduce statements, but they'll only do it for the cardholder, which by the way, is the person who's misusing the funds to begin with. Um, so if you can get them to come with the forensic account to Home Depot, it's a home run. They'll give me all of those reprint the receipts for me, but uh, we haven't been successful at that yet. Nobody wants to accompany a forensic account to Home Depot. So, but we do try, we do try. Um, there, is, the wrench. there is a way, there's always a way. A lot of stores don't have the receipts, but a place like Home Depot or Lowe's does, and they do it for return purposes. Um, you don't need your receipt. They'll just, they'll take the card you used and they'll pull up your last transaction, find it, and they'll return it. So we have to keep up with the technology of the stores and where people are going. But without the receipt, especially in probate, when we're trying to determine if the fiduciary spent the funds for the benefit of the person or not, without the receipts, it's just so hard. And so we look for patterns and trends. And I was talking to an attorney this morning explaining it and said, well, if they have all the receipts but stop and shop, then you know there's a problem with stop and shop because you, you can't have all these other receipts and no stop and shop. There's probably a reason for it. All right. So the stores come up a lot. Uh, these stores have good records if you can get access to them, if they'll respond to you. Amazon comes up a lot. Amazon seems to be, well, it's, it's obviously widely used because of the ease of buying things for Amazon, but it's also potentially abused by people who are misusing funds in a lot of different contexts. And the problem with it is all you see on the statements is Amazon. Amazon has a wealth of information if you can get them to respond to you. They can give you a, a time range. They can tell you what things bought. They can tell you the, all the details. They'll tell you where it was delivered, what was delivered, when it was delivered. Um, and we did a case recently. This is how we put it together. It was an employee embezzlement. And we were able to call out of that spreadsheet they produced all of the deliveries that went to their residence or family member residence that had no business purpose. Without that file, we, we wouldn't, there, there's not going to be an Amazon folder. We're going to look at file cabinets in just a moment. All right. There is no Amazon. If there is an Amazon folder, my experience is sometimes there is an Amazon folder or a Home Depot. It's empty. And that's good though, because that tells me that they had records, right? They, they did exist. They're just gone now. And they're probably gone for a reason, right? But well, these are places that do have good records. They, if, if they use the card, if, if they're just submitting a receipt to Costco to get reimbursed, um, not, not so much good information. Then we get into this whole new world that not only are we seeing more electronic, but our currencies are changing. And, and it's already made it into these different contexts. So you can expect that at some point in time, you're not only going to be, be dealing with just you know the dollar or credit cards or checking accounts, but you're going to be dealing with Bitcoin. Things are being paid for in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is starting to show up more and more because it can. And how do you get access to somebody's Bitcoin account? How do you get access to figure out what did they do? Where is it? It's very challenging, all right? And this is areas that there's a ton of stuff going on in our world to just get educated on it because I am not an expert on cryptocurrencies or any of these other digital assets that are occurring, um, but they're popping up as are these. Um, non-currency payment transactions. So my experience with Venmo was that my kids went to college, they needed money. I went to Venmo, I transferred them money. The end. And it wasn't until we did a case where Venmo is showing up on all the statements and it was too much activity that I learned Venmo is actually a bank account. So I can, I can have people Venmo me, I can have it come to my account automatically, or I can I can just let it ride, just like a bank account, just leave it in there. Then I can pay people by Venmo because I have a balance that's building. Well, if I want to hide assets, how hard would it be to set up a Venmo account and just start funneling everything to the Venmo account? 
how much access do we as forensic accounts have to someone's Venmo account? None, because they, it's going to be in the name of the person that you're trying to get information about. And businesses are using Venmo and PayPal and all of these different venues. Currencies, tax app comes up a lot. Amazon Pay, Zelle is showing up more and more. Every time I log into my, my m &T, it wants me to set up my Zelle account. I don't want a Zelle account. I don't know what Zelle is. Um, I have a brother who lives in Chicago. He owes me $300. That's been since September. He'll only Zelle it to me. But I don't want to set up a Zelle account, so I'm just waiting. But I, I'm going to have to because it's the only way we can keep up with what's going on is I have to set up some of these and see how they work to understand when I'm talking to the attorneys. These are the records. This is how it works. This is what you need to see, or this is what we're looking for. And more and more of this, I think you're going to see more and more of this happening as we get into the electronic currency, electronic exchange. Um, and right now, here in Connecticut, we're having a big problem with check fraud. So history repeats itself. We're in a down economy, and we're starting to see theft of mail, check washing, and counterfeit checks again. I thought those were gone forever, and yet they're happening throughout Connecticut again. And the only way to really minimize your risk of check washing or um, check fraud is to minimize the number of checks you write. Okay, so then if I'm not going to write checks, how am I going to pay the people I need to pay? Well, I'm going to turn to an alternative currency. I'm going to go to one of these other means. Less checks in circulation, less risk that one of them is going to be check washed or check counterfeited. And so um, a lot of things are happening right now in the world of fraud anyway. As far as tax returns, the 4506 team, that, that used to work well. And then the IRS got decimated and, and it, they just stopped responding to these requests for the transfer. So you don't get a tax return that looks like this. This would be nice. You get a transfer that you got to kind of figure out what are the pieces and how does it go. And you're probably going to have to drop it into a spreadsheet to figure it out. And, and then it's going to look looking like this when you're done. Uh, but they could take 12 weeks. They could take you know, three months if you get it. So that, that process too, and now the IRS is ramping up their hiring and they're hiring tens of thousands of employees. So we might see that come back, but it's the only way to get a tax return. And again, when we get to reliability with the software that's available, we're back to versions of tax returns. And what I mean by versions is it is so easy to create different versions for different purposes. If you are going borrowing, to show a real positive one. If you are going through a buy-sell, maybe you want to show a negative one. Depends on what you're trying to do. So the only one that matters to us is which one did you buy? Right, That's the one I care about because it's so easy to just change the scenario in the software and then you have a, what looks like a brand new tax return, stamp it, draft, buy it only, hand it out. Um, Reliability. So that's the next issue. So paper versus electronic files. And QuickBooks comes up a lot. It's not the only package, but it's the most widely used package for a lot of businesses. And it comes up quite a bit in these disputes. Even in probate, a lot of fiduciaries will keep track of their accountings in, probate, in QuickBooks, which, which is it's ideal. I was a trustee. I kept track of it in QuickBooks. The paper records are never if you're looking at a package, are never as adequate as the file itself. There's so much information in QuickBooks that you have access to in the file that you will never have on printed reports. And, and I've been to court on this. I've had to write affidavits on this. There are, QuickBooks is a great, it's a great solution if it's in the hands of the right people. In the hands of someone who wants do ill will, it is the best package out there. It is the most manipulated, easy to manipulate system that exists. And I used to install systems so I can say that. All right, I can alter, delete, change anything I want, anytime I want. If I, if I have to produce financial information pursuant to a, a, a subpoena or printed reports, if I have accounts that I don't want you to know, I'll just simply hide them from you. You'll never know there's hidden bank accounts on a printed report. So there are so many things that I can, that I can do that a, a printed report will never tell you the complete picture. Right? 
There are audit logs. One of the first things I want to know on QuickBooks, is it on or off? It is on by default. If somebody turned off the audit log, they did it consciously. That right tells me I'm already wondering why you would turn that off. The audit log is the only place you will know if somebody altered, changed, or deleted the transaction. Now, in an accounting system, you shouldn't have any of that functionality. You should be able to avoid and re-enter, but alter, change, delete never should exist. But it does in QuickBooks. So I always encourage if you're using someone QuickBooks, get the electronic file, the actual file QuickBooks, not a backup, not the accountant's copy, not a portable copy. It's one file. And the more that they won't give it to you, the more you know there's a problem. Because it's so easy, it's so transportable, and, and it can be protected through a number of ways, confidentiality orders, that, that whatever the issue is, there's really no digital bar to getting it. QuickBooks Online. So if there's been a big shift with going to QuickBooks Online, which I think is a much inferior system. It doesn't have the bells and whistles. It doesn't have the functionality. It's online. They're not going to simply be able to make you a copy of the system. It, there is no copy of a file. It's not on anyone's hard drive. It's on the cloud. It's a whole different issue when you want to access, electronically access their QuickBooks file. Now you're asking for a user ID and password to be added or you're sitting next to the party generating the information yourself. And because of the amount of manipulation that we've seen, it is so easy to create PDFs. It's so easy to take a file like QuickBooks, take the reports, put them in Excel, make them look just like QuickBooks, except change the amount, change the amounts, and then produce them so they look like QuickBooks. So we're a big fan that if we have the ability, we want to be sitting there when you generate this stuff. If we can't take it, then we want to sit there right with you when you generate it. So I know the process that went through. Otherwise, I, I don't know if it's reliable or not completely because I've seen so much manipulated through the systems over the years. If I get QuickBooks, and I have a case right now, we have a QuickBooks file, but we have no other records. All right, QuickBooks is just QuickBooks. You can make it say anything you want. QuickBooks in and of itself without corroborating information is not of a lot of value. It'll tell a story. It just may not, you'll never know if it's the story. You need the bank statements to see if what was entered into QuickBooks is actually reality. Does it match anything? And that without that, I don't think QuickBooks has limited value. It may or may not be accurate. So we corroborate things. We want the QuickBooks file, we want the bank statements. And then if we get the tax return, we want to see does the financial records of whatever the target is match what's on a tax return. It should. And if not, why doesn't it reconcile? But we really don't stop there because we also want to do a triangular reconciliation. Does the bank statement reconcile with the accounting records? Does the accounting records, records reconcile with the tax return? It should. And then go one step further, if they have other types of tax returns, like sales and use tax returns, do the four quarters or 12 monthly sales tax returns match the bank statements, the bank, the um, accounting records, and the tax return? It all should work. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to work. All right, payroll tax report, same thing, 941. We should be able to reconcile this four quarters, the, nine, the W2s, W3s, all reconciled. If we're working in an environment where the point of sale, it's a restaurant, it's a medical practice, it's a dental practice, there's a fifth corroboration because they have a whole nother system that keeps track of appointments, charges, collections, adjustments. Point of sale has for a restaurant has everything in it. QuickBooks only has what they deposited in it. In a true world, they should match. But how would you know unless you have the point of sale system? So that's what we're trying to do. If we get access to it, how reliable is the stuff that we're getting? And then of course, the last piece of it is adequacy. So with adequacy, we, we, we being an accountant for, for as long as I have, you have an expectation of what records should exist, okay? Even if you're the uh, volunteer treasurer for a school club in a high school, that's going to raise money for the band to go to Washington, D.C. 
you have an expectation that somewhere there's going to be some kind of tracking. And then as it gets more sophisticated, then you have that expectation that there are going to be records. It's hard to run a business or it's hard to keep track of fiduciary records or whatever it is if you have no records. Or you have, there is always a system. It may be a spiral on notebook. That's all right. That's that to us. We'll add that up. As long as we can corroborate it to the bank statements and to other records, if that's how they kept the records, that is fine. But there's a there's got to be some way of keeping track of the records. So we have a lot of discussions. We get pulled into hearings with the expectation of records and what we're going to get promised. And then when we get the records, this is what we end up getting. Next to nothing. This is all we can find. This is all that exists. This is all that was maintained. And I see everybody smiling because you've probably seen the same thing that we have. Um, I just watched a movie called The Good Nurse. And The Good Nurse is, I guess, one of the most popular streamed movies right now. And the police officers were promised boxes of records on the investigation from the hospital. And they waited and they waited. And then they showed up and they walked in with a file folder. And they completely lost it because they're like, where are all the boxes? Where are all the records? And they're like, this is what we're going to give you right here. This is it. <laughs> this is our complete investigation. All right. And I, that's my world. All right. That's my world. We know there's file cabinets. We know records are maintained. We, so to do anything, there's some kind of a system in place. By the time we get there, this is what we find. Empty file cabinets, folders that were there. There's nothing there. For whatever reason, all right, and then we have to go through a lot of issues with council and court trying to demonstrate that they had to have records. And it's a piecemeal job. If we get the bank statements, then there's check images. If we have check images, then we have vendor invoices. Where are the vendor invoices? Sometimes we have to subpoena the vendors and have them reproduce their invoices. But if it's seven years out, nobody has that information anymore. So time is of the essence trying to get the records. Um, the longer we expand the period we're looking at, the more likely we're never going to get all of the records anymore. Everybody's gone green. Nobody prints statements. Nobody prints this stuff anymore. They reconcile it. And the answer is, I can print it anytime I want. So why do I need to maintain it? Which is true until you try to access it and it doesn't work. And that happens quite a bit. A picture in time. So a lot of <laughs> If you just get one of, it doesn't tell the story of what happened. A, a tax return is a point in time, right? It doesn't tell you what happened last year or next year. It's just a point in time. This is the year they had. And on the balance sheet, this is last year's and this year's balance sheet, okay? Same thing with financial statements. They're a picture in time. They're produced after it's already occurred. What I'm a big advocate for as I wrap up my section is, as you think about the records, you need to trend it. You need to get information. It's not just one tax return. You want to trend this information. If you want to see why a, a shareholder never got a dividend because uh, no dividends were ever declared, although there was plenty of cash in the entity year after year after year, then you want to figure out what did they do with the cash? If there was plenty of cash and they were flushed with the cash, why didn't they do dividends? Why didn't they give anything to the to these these owners, these shareholders? Look at the balance sheet trends. Did they buy? You know, what were they? Did they pay down debt? Did they buy equipment? You won't see that with one point in time. So it's critical that when you're getting records, that we we get enough of a period so we can see the trend and see what happened. And with that, we're at the end of my session, and I'm going to hand it back to Mike. To pass the gavel on to Tom, who is our, our next presenter. So thank you very much, Steve, uh, for that excellent information and, and those beneficial slides. So you've now investigated your claims and have a better understanding of the information that you obtained and you're preparing to present your witnesses and your evidence and to help navigate uh, that ship into the harbor and explain how to get those documents. And I, I present Tom Lett. Uh, for those of you who don't know Tom, um, he is a very accomplished trial lawyer and business litigator with over three years of experience handling complex business disputes on behalf of public and private companies in Connecticut and across the country. He's well known in Connecticut state and federal court 
as a result of his presence and leadership within the Connecticut and Hartford County Bar Associations. He's prosecuted and defended clients on a broad range of civil matters, including patent infringement, trademark, copyright, trade secret, uh, and contract litigation. His clients include Fortune 500 manufacturers, tech companies, retailers, financial institutions, and nonprofits. Um, he has a long um, and dedicated uh, experience in public service, uh, working with a number of uh, charitable organizations and boards. He's a graduate of Boston University School of Law and the State University of New York at Buffalo. He is uh, a member by peer recognition of the American Board of Trial Advocates, a former president of the County Hartford County Bar Association, and a fellow of both the American Bar Foundation and the Connecticut Bar Foundation. With that, I will turn it over to Tom Reggie. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you, Steve. And there's one more thank you that I, I think I'm obligated uh, to be late, and that is for St. Johnson my associate who is here and who worked with me to put together uh, the materials that I'm about to discuss with all of you. Um, I, I noticed a couple of smiles in the room when Mike uh, said, I have over three years of experience handling uh, business litigation cases. There was a time when I had about three years of experience and I had a lot more hair. I've been doing this uh, for well, this will be 35 years. So I, I think I've learned a few things along the way. Uh, I know that there are a couple of you in the room who have more experience than, than I do. And I, I know that there are some of you in the room who have less experience uh, than I do. Hopefully what I'm gonna say will offer something for each of you. Uh, so we will see. So we've talked about uh, obtaining the information, We've talked about um, understanding the information, but the information to this point is useless to those of us uh, who try cases unless we can get it into evidence, of course. And so we turn to the rules of evidence, uh, which we find in, in the federal rules, in the Connecticut Code of Evidence, to some extent in, in, uh, in our uh, general statutes and uh, in, in the case law. Um, we know uh, from law school and from practice that the rules of evidence are rules of exclusion. So evidence, all of these documents are coming in unless there's a reason to keep them out. And the reasons to keep them out are relevance and inability to establish that they're relevant and inability to establish that they're authentic and inability uh, to provide when required the best evidence and uh, because of the hearsay, uh, which keeps out evidence that does not fall within uh, a recognized exception. And there are really two exceptions that we're gonna talk about most today. And those, uh, and, and the, what the primary one is the business records exception. Um, uh, and we're also going to talk about the uh, statement of a party opponent. And I'm gonna suggest that um, you can get 90% of your evidence into evidence at your hearing, at trial, with just under, a mastery of these rules. Uh, the rules of relevance, of authentication, understanding of the best evidence rule, and, uh, and the hearsay rule, and the exceptions to the hearsay rule, principally to the statement of a party opponent and the business records exception. There are, of course, a number of other rules of evidence but you're gonna get 90% of your evidence before the court, before the, the tribunal, if you have an understanding and mastery um, of these rules. So let's start with relevance. So the Connecticut Code of Evidence, section 4-1, makes clear that um, any evidence uh, or any document or any information having any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is material to the determination of the proceeding more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence is relevant. And the federal rule says essentially the same thing. So with respect to relevance, what is it? What does it concern? What does it address? 
What does it relate to? How does it relate to the claims and defenses in the case? These are the these are the questions that need to be answered in order to establish relevance. Related to relevance is the concept of reliability. If it's if it's not reliable, it's not relevant to proving or disproving the cause of action. And so reliability becomes an important concept as well. And you'll see that again come up with respect to the requirement of authentication, particularly when we talk in a little while about uh, electronically stored information and computer generated information. You're going to see how the rules and, and how the case law, some of the principal cases uh, discuss and are concerned with uh, reliability of the evidence that's being presented. So once we've established that something is relevant, now we've got to establish that it is authentic. What is it? We want to have someone testify, uh, ideally, if we're, if we're establishing authentication by direct evidence, or there are occasions when uh, authenticity can be established circumstantially, particularly, again, with respect to uh, electronic information. Emails is a good example. Um, uh, we're going to want to establish that the, whatever it is, it is what uh, we offer it to be. It is what it purports to be. And uh, the Connecticut Code of Evidence, Section 9-1 and Rule 901 of the Federal Rules of Evidence uh, both say the same thing, that the requirement of authentication as a condition preceding to admissibility is satisfied by evidence sufficient to support a finding that the offered evidence is what its proponent claims it to be. So we have the witness on the witness stand, we put the document in front of the witness, we ask the witness uh, what it is. This is, a, this is an email, this is a letter that I wrote or that was received by me from John Smith. Uh, that, and together with uh, relevance, uh, will be uh, will go a long way to getting the document into evidence, and certainly that question will satisfy uh, the authentication uh, concern. Um, how do we authenticate? Well, uh, again, uh, we go to the rules nine three of the Connecticut Code of Evidence and Federal Rule of Evidence nine hundred one B. Uh, tells us that a witness with personal knowledge may testify that the offered evidence is what its proponent claims it to be. And Federal Rule of Evidence 901B says essentially, essentially the same thing. So then we come to the best evidence rule. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the best evidence rule, but I am going uh, to spend at least a little bit uh, of time here. Um, and um, a lot of focus on section 10-2 of the Connecticut Code of Evidence, which says a copy of a writing, recording, or photograph is admissible to the same extent as an original, unless, and then it provides several exceptions. And if we look up on top at 10-1, we see that to prove the content of a writing, recording, or photograph, the original writing, recording, or photograph is required. But there are exceptions to that. And so under 10-2, a copy of a writing, recording, or photograph is admissible to the same extent as an original unless a genuine question is raised as to the authenticity of the original or the accuracy of the copy, or uh, under the circumstances, it would be unfair to admit the copy in lieu of the original. If we think about uh, the practicality of trying a thing. So authenticity issues that are going to be fleshed out in uh, compliance with the pretrial order that the court requires. And so a lot of these authenticity issues are going to be known to counsel going into the trial, sometimes going into a hearing, whether it's a prejudgment remedy hearing or a temporary injunction hearing or otherwise. But there will be times and, and really the reason for that is because of the discovery process. So the discovery process will flesh out a lot of any authenticity concerns um, and uh, compliance with the trial management order likewise will 
flush out any authenticity concerns and they'll get addressed. And so you likely won't spend much of any time really having to authenticate a document in connection with a trial where you've had advanced discovery and compliance with the trial management one. But take, for example, a preliminary hearing. Maybe it's a pre-judgment remedy hearing. Maybe it's a temporary injunction hearing. Maybe there are uh, some other proceeding that requires you to present evidence. And you have not yet had the opportunity for discovery, or maybe the court did not require in connection with that early proceeding compliance with a trial management order. You may well find yourself having to authenticate a document, and you may find challenges to authenticity because opposing counsel has not yet had an opportunity through the discovery process uh, to determine something is in fact what uh, you claim it to be. Well, uh, it is in that situation uh, where you're going to need to be able to present evidence that establishes that uh, um, something is authentic. And it may be in that situation where you might be held to the best evidence rule as well. But be advised, be aware that there are, in most situations, um, an exception to the best evidence rule that does not require the production of an original. And therefore, um, a, a copy, whether it's of a writing, a recording, or a photograph, will, will suffice. And then we come to hearsay. So hearsay, and, and we all recall this from law school, and those who are, of us who have tried cases know this well, hearsay, uh, whether it is the Connecticut Code of Evidence or it's under the federal rules of evidence, is a statement other than one made by the declarant while testifying at the proceeding offered in evidence to establish the truth of the matter asserted. So, um, a statement other than one made by the declarant while testifying. So we're talking about out-of-court statements, statements that are made outside of the courtroom that are often offered to establish the truth of, a, of the matter asserted. So it's not hearsay if it's not offered to prove the, uh, what it says. If you're offering a document that has a statement in it, but you're not offering it to substantively prove the content of that statement, it's not hearsay. How does that arise? Well, it might arise because of notice. You want to offer the statement in order to show that notice was provided to the other side. Not that the contract was actually breached, but that the other side was put on notice that you claimed a breach or that you claimed the commission of a tort. Um, another example would be simply to prove the fact that something was said in a document without having, uh, without needing to prove the substantive truth of what is said. Again, that's not hearsay because it's not offered to prove the truth of what is Another example would be to perhaps explain the effect of that statement on the listener. Here's the statement that caused uh, the plaintiff to act in a certain way. Here's the statement that caused the defendant to act in a certain way. You might be offering that statement in order to explain later conduct, not because of the truth of what the statement says. In that circumstance, that's not hearsay under uh, both the state court and the federal rules. Hearsay, of course, is, however, generally excluded unless it falls within an exception. All hearsay is out unless it is allowed per an exception. Connecticut Code of Evidence Section 8-2A says hearsay is inadmissible, except as provided in the code, the general statutes, the practice book, or in uh, the decisions of the Connecticut Supreme Court. Rule 802 says uh, the same thing. Hearsay is not admissible unless any of the following provides otherwise. Now, as I said, there are many, many exceptions to the hearsay. Um, we're going to focus on, on two, the statement of a party opponent and the business records exception to the hearsay. But there are a number of others. Spontaneous utterance, statement of then existing mental or emotional condition, statement of then existing uh, physical condition, the ancient documents exception, the public records exception, 
So there are a number of exceptions to the hearsay. But particularly when we're trying business cases um, and we're working with business related documents, um, if we have mastery of uh, business records exception and of the rule that regarding statements of a party opponent, most of, uh, most of our documents are going to come into evidence under one of those two exceptions. With respect to <clears throat> statement of a party opponent, it's interesting that the state court rules in the federal court <clears throat> is treated a little bit different. The outcome is the same. It's a statement of a party opponent that comes into evidence. But under the Connecticut Code of Evidence, a of a party opponent is admissible hearsay because the statement of a party opponent is identified if it falls within an exception. Under the federal rules, it's different. It's specifically defined as not hearsay. So under the state court rules, we need to satisfy an exception to the state court rule because the statement of a party opponent is hearsay. Under the federal rules, it's not hearsay. Under Rule 801D, it is specifically identified as something that falls outside of uh, the hearsay rule. If we go back to the state court rule under section 8-3-1, I think it is worth understanding, and I'm going to read a little bit of this in order to understand exactly what it is that falls within that exception. A statement that is being offered against a party and is a the party's own statement in either an individual or a representative capacity. B, a statement that the party has adopted or approved. In other words, whether it's actually that party's statement or not. C, a statement by a person authorized by the party to make a statement concerning the subject. D, a statement by the party's agent, servant, or employee. And I could go on. There are uh, there are uh, further uh, elements of this rule that I think are very informative with respect to what is and what is not uh, does not constitute a statement of a party opponent. But as you can see, statement of a party opponent is under the state court rules is very, very. It's a very broad exception to the rule against hearsay in our under our code of evidence in our jur jurisprudence. Um, but as I say, the federal rule does treat it differently because it specifically uh, defines it under AO1B as not hearsay. We're going to talk next about the business records exception to the hearsay rule. And the rationale is where I want to start. What is the rationale for the business records exception to the rule? And the rationale under both the state court rules and the federal court rules is trustworthiness. Documents that are created and maintained for business purposes are recognized as being inherently uh, trustworthy, as opposed to, for example, documents that are created for the specific purpose of litigation, where the uh, author of the document has, in that case, likely an agenda. So that's the rationale for the business record succession. We go to the next slide. I want to first point out um, earlier today, we circulated, Jan circulated, or Jeanette, I can't remember which of the two of you circulated an updated version of this uh, slide uh, deck. And there was an error here where the first line referred to Connecticut Code of Evidence Section 8 2 -E -E. So if any of you are working off of that or referring to that, or that initial slide deck, I just want to point out to you. Uh, that there was an error, it has been corrected, it was distributed to you all, and it is corrected in what you see on the screen, and that is, it is actually section 8-4 and that I want to be referring to. And this is, together with uh, Connecticut General Statute section 52-1A, the business records exception to the hearsay rule. So what do we need to establish in order to get a business record into evidence as an exception to 
uh, to rule against hearsay. Well, we've got to establish that the document was made in the regular course of business. We've got to establish that it was the regular course of business to make the writing a record and that it was made essentially contemporaneously with the act or event that is at issue that is being recorded. And the federal rule 8036 has exactly the same elements in order to establish the business records exception. I want to talk a little bit more about the contemporaneous creation requirement because um, it doesn't have to be exactly contemporaneous. It, it doesn't need uh, to be immediate that the record is created relative to whatever the act or event is that's being recorded. As uh, you see in Calpano versus Calpano, it is, a, it is sufficient for a witness to testify that it was the regular business practice to create a document within a reasonable time after the occurrence of the event. But you also see a pronouncement out of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals that six months later after the event is not sufficiently contemporaneous. That's not a reasonable amount of time. And in that case, the business records exception could not apply to the document because what I'm referring to as the contemporaneous uh, element of the business records exception was not met. A regularly conducted activity uh, is a necessary element of meeting this exception. Um, activities which are part of a regular practice maintained in a consistent way and focused on a certain range of issues uh, that were relevant to the author's business are admissible. Now, I want to take a step back for a second and, and, um, and talk for a few minutes about the original purpose of the business records exception as it was created and a little bit about how it has in fact evolved. Because I think as, um, as we read the rule and the exceptions to the rule, we read them very strictly. We're talking about a regularly conducted business activity, something that happens all the time. Um, and that that activity is recorded at or about the time or within a reasonable amount of time thereafter as the activity has occurred. Well, if you think about, for example, the person who sits in, um, in, the, um, in the booth at a trucking facility, recording the trucks coming in and going out, taking in um, the truck number, the identity of the driver, the weight of the truck, um, the time that the truck enters the yard, as well as the time that the truck leaves the yard, the weight of the truck at that time, the identity of the driver and the truck number. I mean, that's a classic uh, recording of information in a log that the business records exception to the hearsay rule uh, was designed to allow into evidence. But over the course of, of uh, time and um, creative lawyering um, and otherwise, the business records exception has come, to, has come to embrace much more than that. And the question is, how much more than that? And how much more is often dependent upon the judge that you're in front of. Mm -hmm. um, it is the case, I think, uh, that some judges will, for example, allow emails to come into evidence um, as uh, part of a regularly conducted business activity. What, what is more regular an activity than, uh, than drafting and sending an email in the course of business? Um, is that what the rule was originally designed to address? No, of course not. Are there judges who will not allow emails to come in under the uh, business records exception to the hearsay rule as a matter of course? Yes, uh, there are. Um, and there are just about every document you can imagine used in for a business purpose in between those two examples that I've just, uh, just provided. Um, where you might find yourself in a fight over whether something qualifies uh, as an exception um, to the hearsay rule because it constitutes a business record. I think it's 
important to have a backup plan when you're offering this kind of information into evidence um, because not everything that is used in connection with uh, the business or created in connection with the business is necessarily going to be recognized by uh, the judge that you're before as qualified as a business record under the business record succession to hearsay. On the other hand, I think you will find that in most cases, these kinds of records, emails included, are often going to. So the advisory here is to be aware and ready for that situation where the judge says, no, -uh, that's not the kind of regularly conducted business activity where you're simply recording information in a consistent and contemporaneous way. Just because you write an email uh, to your contract counterparty uh, that sets forth your position on a matter uh, doesn't make it a business record. If you're issuing a purchase order, yes, definitely. If you're issuing a sales order acknowledgement, yes, definitely. If you're recording uh, sales activity information in a log, for sure. Um, but when you get to the kinds of communications often authored in the business setting that are not as regular and as part of a regular activity um, as the three examples that I just gave, it does become a closer call for some judges. And I think we all need to be aware of that. I'm being reminded of the time here, so I'm gonna to try to keep this moving along. I wanna talk just for a minute about, um, about the opportunity to lay a foundation for a business record through um, certification. So section 9-3A of the Connecticut Code of Evidence allows exactly that. You can, without presenting a live witness, lay the foundation for a business record by essentially providing an affidavit that highlights all of the various elements. Section 9-3A uh, allows you to do that. Uh, General Statute Section 52-180 is where our business records exception uh, appears in the general statutes. And section B says, the writing or record shall not be rendered inadmissible by a party's failure to produce as witnesses the person or persons who made the writing or record or who have personal knowledge of the act, transaction, occurrence, or event recorded, or the party's failure to show that such persons are unavailable as witnesses. So to lay the business records foundation, you don't need uh, the individual that created the document. And, uh, and you don't need necessarily uh, a live witness. But you must have someone who is persistent, who has knowledge about the process by which the document or the record was kept and recorded and maintained in the ordinary uh, course of business. The federal rules likewise will allow uh, records to be presented through a process of certification. Hearsay within hearsay. This is a problem oftentimes with respect to uh, certain emails to the extent that they're offered as, uh, as an exception to the hearsay rule. Oftentimes these uh, documents and others like them will include references to statements made by others. So the record itself, the document constitutes hearsay, but we can bring it within an exception, but the document refers to a statement made by uh, a third party um, that also constitutes hearsay. And now we've got to find an exception within the hearsay rule uh, for that statement as well in order to make sure that every level of hearsay uh, within the document, two levels, perhaps three levels, um, meet an exception in order to get this document into evidence. Um, Connecticut Code uh, section 
8-7 and federal rule of evidence 805 makes clear that if we're dealing with one with more than one level, say we have to satisfy an exception for every single level. Electronically stored information. I'm going to throw out a fact. I don't know if it's a fact, actually. It may be entirely apocryphal, but I think it makes a point that is pertinent to uh, the times within which we live and uh, the difficulty or the unique challenges that these that this presents for, for trial lawyers. So if we consider all of the information or data generated from the beginning of the world until January 1, 2000, whether that data uh, was recorded on, on sandstone or in a scroll or uh, on parchment or recorded by a typewriter or uh, a word processor, processor or a computer from the beginning of the world until January 2020. It is said that we generate an equivalent amount of data every two to three days. That's, a rem that's remarkable. Again, I don't know if it's true or not, but it makes, it, it demonstrates the point, I think, that electronically stored information is really where this is at uh, for purposes of business records and getting them into evidence. And that means that in addition to everything else that we've discussed relative to authenticity, relevance, best evidence, and exceptions to the hearsay rule, We've got to be cognizant of where this information that we're using is coming from, how and if it was computer generated in some way, or if it was merely stored on a computer. So if we look at the information on the left-hand column on the screen, that's computer stored information. Those are business records, just like any other document or record uh, we might think of. And the rules of evidence, as we've been discussing them, apply to the information on that side uh, of, uh, of the slide. The information on the right-hand side of the slide falls into the category of computer-generated data. And that it, the, the underlying data may well be uh, information data or come from documents that fall within an exception to the hearsay rule, including the business records exception. But this is information that has been in some way manipulated by the software program or the computer that requires a heightened level of sensitivity by us as lawyers trying to get it into evidence. And it certainly uh, presents a heightened level of sensitivity uh, by judges. So generally, electronically stored information, which is the information on the left of that screen, that's treated in the same way as other written materials. But information may be excluded based on evidence that the information is untrustworthy or unreliable. And so to the extent that there may be questions about the quality of data entry with respect to a business record, that's something that we need to address. To the extent that there are concerns about how the data may have been manipulated, going back to a point that Steve made earlier, that's something we need to be prepared to address. So special considerations for electronically stored information. If a database is maintained in the ordinary course of business, just like that person who sits in the booth at the, um, at the uh, place where the trucks come in and out of the yard, if, databases, if the database is maintained in the ordinary course of business, the case law says information may be selectively pulled from that database as a subset, and it will qualify as, a, as an exception to the hearsay rule under the business records exception. But the criteria that was used in order to cull that information, that subset from the larger data set, 
is likely information that's going to have to be explained in order to satisfy the rule of reliability that we talked about earlier. In addition to meeting the three requirements of the business record succession, you're saying the proponent is going to have to establish oftentimes that the basic elements of the computer system are reliable. Now, a cautionary note here. Is that really still the rule? Well, that's a 2015 case from our Connecticut Appellate Court. That's not all that long ago. Most judges, particularly when we're talking about programs that are well recognized, whether it's Microsoft Excel as an example, or Intuit QuickBooks, um, and when we're talking about computers generally, most judges understand that these are reliable programs, that computers are are used in a widespread manner in every facet of uh, human life and endeavor. And there are not a lot of questions about the reliability so long as the underlying software program is one that is known and recognized as reliable. You think using the example of a calculator, a calculator is a computer, but no one questions when we put eight times four into the calculator and it produces 32. Nobody questions the process by which that happened. Anymore. And we're getting there slowly, I think, with respect to uh, computer generated information. But I think it's important to recognize that questions can arise depending upon the familiarity of the general public, the judge um, with uh, the software programs that, that are being used. And so this is where it's important to have someone who's prepared to testify with personal knowledge of the procedures that were used, including the software that was used, and the nature of maybe even the computer equipment that was used in order to generate uh, a document or um, uh, a compilation of of computer information. There are two cases that I want to point out that are, I think, very important to understand. One is state versus swing. And this is a statement of, this is a, a Connecticut Supreme Court case dealing with computer-generated evidence. The other case that I want to uh, point out is a case out of the Federal District Court in the District of Maryland, Lorraine versus Mark. Well, what does that have to do with what we're, with what we're doing here in Connecticut? Well, Lorraine versus Markle is actually cited no less than three times in under the authenticity rules in our Connecticut Code of Evidence. And in this case, Judge Grimm goes through the process of authenticating or the considerations that should go into the process for authenticating email, websites, text messages, computer stored records and data, digital photographs, digital enhancements, and computer animations and simulations. And so this is an important decision together with state versus state. We need to understand uh, in order to be able to deal with some of the unique authenticity issues that are often raised with respect to computer stored information, and computer generated uh, information. With respect to computer stored information, I think I can say very confidently that if it's simply a matter of storage and retrieval, uh, the process for authenticating it, establishing its reliability, and getting it into evidence on the business records exception, the hearsay rule is not going to be a heavy, a heavy lift. If we're talking about computer simulations, uh, information that is manipulated by the computer uh, and the software program, that's where it's going to be a much more uh, significant lift on the part of the proponent of that kind of evidence. And it may require expert testimony, establishing the process that was employed in order to mine the information or manipulate the information. And when I say manipulate, I don't necessarily mean in a pejorative way. I mean, information, as you all know, that gets put into the Excel format 
uh, can be manipulated in order to mine uh, the kind of report and make uh, the, and the presentation of uh, evidence in the way we want to present it. There may be certain fields in the Excel format that really are of no interest uh, to us as the proponent of the evidence or uh, ultimately the fact finder. Um, but there are other fields that, of course, are critical. And it's those fields that are going to be manipulated by the computer in, or, or the software program in order to develop the document that you're going to offer into evidence. And so having someone who's knowledgeable about that process and the tools that were used, both hardware and software, um, either from the business itself, who has personal knowledge, or if we're talking about, for example, simulations, simulation of a car accident, simulation of a building collapse, um, that's going to require in all likelihood expert testimony. I've got one more point that uh, I want to address, and that is the issue of uh, summaries, evidentiary summaries. Um, Federal Rule of Evidence 1006, uh, as well as our state court uh, Connecticut Code of Evidence Section 10-5, allow for the creation of summaries. So if you think of, for example, volumes of information, years and years and years of tax returns, to use that example, and we want to take the adjusted gross income off of the tax returns for each of 25 years. We don't need to put into evidence 25 years of tax returns. We can put in a single sheet that lists year by year uh, the adjusted gross income as taken off of the tax return for each of those years. Under the uh, state court rule, we don't need to present the underlying tax returns in court. We do have to make them available. In the, under the federal rule, we do um, have to uh, make uh, the underlying tax returns available in court in order to get the summary into evidence. But both rules allow for the admissibility of summaries. It's very uh, useful rule of evidence when we're talking about and using and presenting voluminous business information. And both rules allow uh, for uh, software and computer systems to create those summaries. Again, we face the requirement of having someone with personal knowledge and perhaps an expert who will testify to uh, the procedures employed, the equipment and software used, and um, the protocols that were, uh, were required of the software program in order to generate the summary if you're doing it via uh, 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 computer generation in order to get into evidence. Final point, getting this stuff into evidence is not the end game. The end game is using it once it's in evidence. And I think uh, oftentimes we get it into evidence, we take a breathe a deep sigh of relief and we move on to the next document in order to get it into evidence but I think we're making a mistake uh, when we do that. We need to use the document now that it's in evidence in our exam. We need to highlight, to blow it up, to ask the witness about provisions in it, to explain, to direct the court or the jury to the key provisions in the document. We don't just stop because we got it into evidence. The art of persuasion and of advocacy is beginning the document. Thank you. That was uh, thorough and, and excellent. Particularly given the time a lot. Um, speaking of which, um, we moved through this at a breakneck pace, as uh, you could probably tell. Um, we had a lot of material to cover. Hopefully, it was uh, instructive and beneficial to you all. But we also wanted to save some time for questioning, uh, particularly given the unique format that we have here today, where some people are participating remotely and some are here in person. Um, I'm going to ask Jeanette and Jan as to whether or not there were any um, questions that were asked by our remote attendees that we can address now. And if not, I would encourage them if they have questions now, maybe they can start 
peppering uh, you with those questions, and we will turn first to those in attendance who might have some questions. So, no questions right now. Okay, uh, <laughs> that makes it easy. How about uh, of the group in attendance? Um, what can we help with? Sure, Dad. I with you. I guess my first question, and by the way, excellent, all three of you guys, really good presentation. So thank you so much. What is your take on a business record if it's not originally created by you know the business who's offering it? I'm thinking something like a phone bill, a utility bill. Now I'm sure there's different things to be more of a stretch, but yeah, I'm not making this phone bill up. I'm getting it every month. Do I have to go to the phone company and get an affidavit from them or drag one of them people in for subpoena? Or can I just say, yeah, I might not have drafted this myself, but I'm in the business of maintaining the record that my company, I get these phone bills every month, I stick them in the file and have that be good enough. What is your kind of approach for those business records that might have been started outside of the office of the witness? So my, my approach on that, and, and when, I, when I am asking foundational questions with respect to the business record exception, although the rule talks about it, in, in terms of creation of the record, I think keeping and maintaining in the normal and ordinary course of business um, is going to get you over uh, the hurdle that you just described, even though I'm not sure that that really is, again, uh, the, um, the original concept behind the rule. I don't know if there's case law that addresses this, Kevin, uh, or not specifically. But in my experience, the kinds of records you just described are coming in just by having the witness testify that I get this regularly, I get it every month, uh, I keep it uh, um, as part of the normal, uh, my normal and ordinary course of business. And I think, I think, uh, you know, uh, if, if the judge keeps that out, I'd be surprised. I certainly think, you know, Tom's right. Uh, on the money in terms of the legal analysis, I think you also have to consider the practical realities in that situation. I doubt that many judges are going to have a whole lot of patience for a challenge, for example, that would require us to dig deeper on a phone record that every business receives and maintains in some fashion or another on a regular basis. Um, and you know, one of the things that uh, resonated with me during both um, Steve and Tom's presentation is that there are, are, are many judges that I, I think get a bit overwhelmed by this information. And the more that you can simplify, streamline, and stipulate to avoid some of these contests um, over authentication and ultimate admissibility will be very well received and allow you to move these cases a little bit more efficiently and certainly fast. Um, because uh, I was thinking about your, your uh, voluminous uh, uh, records summary and rule knowing that I had a case recently where the choice was, do we spend two hours, you know, authenticating 25 different documents versus this summary? And after a few minutes of hearing it, you could just sort of see the clerk looking at the judge on a regular basis, like, are you serious that you're going to want me to take all 25 of these documents <laughs> into the exhibit list and maintain them uh, through the entirety of this case as opposed to this one pager? Um, so, Lawyers should communicate and, and 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 work these rules, obviously, but with the ultimate end game of an efficient presentation of your case and trial evidence. You know, like I, I had a similar issue a couple weeks ago in a case where I was using a summary, and the other side objected on grounds it was created from litigation, and it was, but it was a summary of information produced in discovery. So I offered it under 10-5 of uh, the evidence bill that Tom was mentioning. But then it's interesting because I happened to pre-mark all the exhibits that were that were mentioned in the summary, and the judge wanted me to ID and offer as full exhibits and go through the mechanics with my witness like you just described. So, you know, part of the problem is not with us. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my goal was to just stick the summary in, yeah. cut to the chase. But I didn't have 25 documents. I think I had like six or seven, but I still had to do it. I, I suspect that there might have been an antenna that went up when the idea was floated that it was prepared in anticipation of litigation 
as opposed to just summarizing a bunch of existing documents that are regularly maintained or produced by the business. That might have been the explanation in that situation. Yeah, um, that's that's it was all right, but I got it in. <laughs> <laughs> so that but that was a bench trial, right? Bench trial, yeah. Yeah. So I I mean, I guess I could I could see in I could understand a judge in a bench trial saying, well, we don't have to worry about confusing me or overwhelming me with a lot of data. Let's just put the underlying records in. Um, and take away the objection uh, if there is one to the summary. Uh, I'll use the summary. I'll be able to focus right in on the information uh, that is in the underlying data. In a jury case, I think that rationale doesn't work because in a jury case, now you're overwhelming uh, the jury which, with, with information that the rules say you don't need. And I'd be much more concerned in that situation. John Matulos, I think you had a question. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I think Bobby did a great job. So thank you for the work and for the time you put into helping us. Now, I've got a question about acquiring records. And this is a little different context. It's a uh, medical malpractice context. Anybody here, anywhere know how you can get your hands on what's called uh, morbidity and mortality committee reports? This is when there's an adverse event in a hospital they have internal reviews that go on and the purpose is to try to find out what happened so as to minimize the likelihood of them happening again. That's gold for the injured person and their attorney who has the claim. So my question is about anyone have ideas about why you that. apparently watched that movie The Good Nurse. So I'm certain <laughs> you can answer this question. Well, well that is the movie. <laughs> that, that's what was happening in the movie, not to give it away, but it, that is still underlying theme of that movie. Well, these are highly specific records that are shielded by a public policy. And yeah. I'm told that there's ways around it, but I don't know what that is. And maybe some of the folks here might have run into that also. Well, I won't tell you how they did it in the movie because I don't want to be a spoiler. <laughs> Watch the movie. There was a way around it, but it's not the way you think. <laughs> now, they did ultimately get the access to that information, but it's Hollywood. <laughs> Yeah, it's a criminal what we're talking in that case. So obviously there, there may have been uh, okay. if we need a kickback from Netflix from the HCBA for that. <laughs> but uh, sorry, I, I can't come up with an answer for that. No so problem. We'll, uh, we'll do what we can it's a little bit off topic. See if we can dig down a little deeper. Other questions. Fine. Tom, are you able to uh, identify certain judges who distinguish between emails as business records and emails as not business records? Uh, or is that Tom and Cooper? I'm not going to do it. Plan B on an email that's not a business record. Where do you go with it? What's your hearsay exception? Well, so, I mean, an email might come in. More often than not, you're going to have either the sender or the recipient or both, you know, on, on the witness stand. So you're going to get it in probably as a statement of a party opponent. Um, that's, you know, again, that's one of the two exceptions that I think by which we get most of our evidence in uh, to evidence. Um, you know, I don't know. You know, again, there are a host of other of other exceptions to the hearsay rule, spontaneous other. Well, that's not going to apply to an email, certainly. But, you know, maybe a statement of uh, mental or emotional condition, physical condition. Um, you know, I'm reaching now uh, a, a little bit. But, uh, I mean, I you know, I am aware of one judge that gives what, and you are too, I think. <laughs> That gives, get his own rules. Gives, uh, gives lawyers a hard time about email. And if you read, <laughs> if, you, if you look at the Markell decision, Judge Grimm out of the uh, District of Maryland, and he talks a little bit about that, about the concern that, you know, just because an email is um, sent from a computer, we don't know who was sitting at the computer at the time the email, or who drafted it, or who sent it. So to attribute it to uh, to the so-called sender, um, if somebody raises an issue about that, that may be something that needs to be addressed. Um, there is, and and the the Markel decision addresses this as well. Um, emails, though, often provide. Uh, circumstantial 
evidence that can be used to authenticate them. Um, now, of course, now I'm switching from, from hearsay to the issue of authentication. But if the goal is to establish that this is a statement of a party opponent and the party opponent has disavowed it, well, um, there is, uh, you know, this, the, 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 uh, there, there is in the email itself evidence that may be used, including not just the sender line, but uh, the fact that there was a reply and the email address that the reply went to. Um, so again, Markel talks about, you know, some of this um, evidence that may be relied upon in the absence of direct evidence to, to uh, authenticate um, this kind of evidence. But that's, a, I mean, any judge who in this takes, you know, uh, the position, even in the absence of uh, someone who raises a, well, in the absence of someone who raises a legitimate issue about uh, whether they were the sender or not, or a legitimate issue about authenticity, I think real is it someone who's not really living in the present day and age. Um, uh, I just, I have a comment that I, that I think this came up recently in the deposition. Where uh, my client had a number of emails that were sent, were which were very long form, no paragraphs. As I was reading them, I noticed that there was a number of receptions. I asked at the deposition, "Did you use some sort of like voice to text software or something?" He said, "Did." Yeah. And typically, when he's sending these long form emails, he was in the car. So he wasn't even reading them as they were being drafted, as they were being sent. Mm -hmm. So that hasn't played out yet. And I don't know how, you know, how to resolve the like veracity of these emails. One or it was just an interesting. Are you intending to offer them or exclude them all? Proceeding to exclude. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So another thing that Markel talks about is, in, in the way of circumstantial evidence to what happened, is. Um, information that may be in the body of the email that only the sender would find. Circumstantial evidence of authenticity that you're attributing that statement to the person you say the sender is. But here it sounds like there might be an issue as to whether the sort of the voice activation software when the guy's driving around in his car is recording <laughs> what he's saying accurately. And I'm assuming that their position is well, he may just be talking aloud, and what's on the page doesn't really reflect what he said. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure how he probes um, specifically um, and get someone who's an expert in this particular voice activation song. Right. Uh, I mean, he kept, he was, he sounds a little extreme. He was asked multiple times, you know, if you draft this, you know, he said, no, I, don't, I don't remember saying that. I didn't say And so uh, it's possible that he did, because the software thing was had an issue that he didn't really read it. Or it was science, so. I, I want to raise um, a question that you and I have uh, around as we were preparing for all of this, and I'd be interested to see what the group's experience has been uh, and what your take on the subject is. But expert reports, as uh, Peter said, um, most of the time in these types of cases, when I've tried them, you know, judges are relieved to have an expert witness um, explain something of, of significance to the case to other lawyers trying to make it up as they go along and act like that with expert witnesses and reports sort of routinely and um, rather conveniently come into evidence without there being much fuss or muss. And many times um, the reports are laden with more hearsay. And the rule is uh, in, in this state and in many others that the, the expert report is hearsay and shouldn't be uh, routinely admitted as a matter of course. Um, there are certainly ways to get the report, the entire report in, but if you have a reason for excluding it, I wouldn't necessarily just capitulate when the other side chooses to offer it. I mean, Steve and I had a case not all that long ago where a forensic accountant had prepared a, a report that contained a police report in it, and I could see where this was going as the witness was being examined and was laying a foundation to put the report into evidence, he wanted the expert to read from the police report. I 
and there was no way on earth that I wanted that to happen. And I raised the objection to the judge, and he looked at me kind of like I had two heads. What are you objecting to the report for? And I said, well, it's by definition hearsay. And there's hearsay within the document. So yes, I'm objecting to it. And you know, I then had to explain, you know, why I'm slowing this process down when there's an expert witness here and we're taking up time with a report that should just come in routinely as a matter of course. So my takeaway from that is that while judges are often relieved to have the benefit of expert testimony to help them, um, that doesn't mean that we should get steamrolled into allowing the report in um, often without fighting about what the contents of the report are and why it's coming in. Uh, yeah, so my I mean, my default position is expert reports are hearsay. An out of court statement offered in court to prove the truth of the matter of search. What could be more hearsay than an expert report? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the expert is going to be on the witness stand and it's subject to cross examination. Uh, my concern more often than not arises when we, we, we all know lawyers are, are involved in drafting. Uh, expert reports, right? I mean, they're providing their input and guiding the expert through that process often. And there's a lot of not just hearsay, but advocacy that is in there. A recitation of the factual background before the expert even gets to his or her analysis and, and conclusions. Well, that's a reminder to the fact finder of the case as opposing counsel wants to present it. And if it's a jury case, that's a huge concern. Um, and, and so on that basis, I, I think that expert reports should not be allowed unless there's an agreement between the parties. Your expert report comes in, my expert report comes in. Um, I think judges take a practical approach to this in most situations. First point being the expert witness is on a stand you can cross-examine without anything that's in the report. The second um, practical approach is particularly if we're talking about a damage expert. And I did have this situation where I've got a, a 35 page uh, report prepared by the expert witness, but only the last two pages provide the numbers uh, that the jury needs to have before them or that the jury needs to recall. Well, the jury isn't going to recall, you know, well, what was the number for lost profits analysis? So what was the uh, what was the number for the unjust enrichment analysis? And what was the number um, for the, um, the out-of-pocket expense analysis? Um, jury's not going to remember that. So the judge said, I'll allow the last two pages of the report, which has the financial figures on it, to come into evidence, the rest of it stay out. He can testify to it on the witness stand. I think that that's probably the strikes the right balance. Other questions, comments, takeaways? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's certainly hearsay, but there's a lot of practical time to do it anyway. I do a lot of valuation trials, whether it's a bankruptcy court, or foreclosure court, where everybody's used to seeing these 200 page phone book appraisals and knows what we're talking about and knows that a lot of that stuff is advocacy or background. But the court and the judge find it a lot more helpful to go through, whether it's for their own analysis to, to have it. And I think it in situations where there's a lot of extraneous yeah. comments or stuff that's attached or junk on there, you got to be more careful. But if it's just a straight up battle of the expert reports and two people kind of have the are on equal footing, sometimes it just makes I, sense. I certainly agree with that, Kevin. I'm just kind of get, giving everybody a different perspective to be careful what you wish for sometimes. Yeah, you sure. want the report to come in because you're uh, prepared to cross examine on it, but you've kind of forgotten that there's something embedded in that report that can really be used to kill you. And once it's in, it's in for all purposes. You're not going to say, oh, well, I didn't really mean to allow the police report. That's <laughs> in this case, you're in, you're in big trouble. So go about the admission of the expert report with the same degree of caution that you would look at any other piece of evidence that opposing counsel is offering um, in order to prepare yourself on. Sort of take off on that, I thought was something interesting you said earlier that I haven't really tried and was curious to even thought that section 1919 reference to an accountant, you know, it's in there, I've heard of it. I, I guess I would always take the approach that if there's a little bit more control, I mean, it's always a, an independent expert, we get to work a little bit more closely with them and kind of pay and, and deal with it. 
what are the situations where you found it to be particularly effective? Maybe as a, as a witness or as an advocate, uh, go have ask the court to make a reference to one of the folks and getting an expert putting one there in order to hear your final review. But the case uh, that I had the most direct experience and uh, ultimately um, went up to the appellate court and the able uh, assistance of Bill O'Sullivan uh, ended up with the result that I had expected to get a trial. Um, but in that case, a, a reference was made uh, simply because the two competing experts um, were so wildly contentious to one another and, and had produced so, such diverse approaches to the underlying issues that we were just spending an inordinate amount of time <laughs> trying to, to, to determine whether these two were on the same page as to what it is that they were tasked with doing and what information had been provided. I think that was a situation where the parties were sort of selecting, selectively feeding information to their expert witnesses, and the expert witnesses were then producing an analysis that had some inherent unreliability. So at some point, the court said, enough's enough. I'm just going to appoint my own expert. This is what the expert now wants to see in order to produce a report that answers these three basic questions. So the judge worked with the appointed expert to sort of craft what the request for information would do, and then ultimately what what the uh, analysis was designed and answered. Did the court come up with that idea, or was it suggested by one of the parties? Well, it was ultimately suggested um, because it just it, it derailed the entire case, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and at some point the clients were sort of coming against sleeve saying. Well, we're going to be in here a month and a half if this continues in this direction. We've got to we've got to come up with something better. And the, the fault lies equally on our side to their side. Well, isn't there some way of getting some of the objectives to look at it? So I'll give credit for credit is due. It was my client finally saying, look, I'm sick of this battle of the experts. Isn't there a better way? And we came up with the, the, the use of a motion for reference and the judge there. Questions, comments, other comments from the uh, remote crowd? No. Thank you all very, very much for your time, attention, and patience today. I hope that this was helpful. Uh, if you have other questions, the three of us are going to stick around for a little while longer. Um, but we, we certainly appreciate everyone here for the effort today, and I hope something good came out. Well, thank you. you. Thank you.